will make a start. Uh, today's lecture is going to be about uh, titanium and its alloys. And I pointed out to you in the last lecture that titanium has a very high melting temperature, 16, 70 degrees centigrade. That's higher than that of iron. It's about 15, 50 degrees centigrade. It has a low density of the order of 4.5 grams per centimeter cubed. And therefore, it isn't surprising that the vast majority of titanium is used in the aerospace industry, so aircraft and spacecraft and so forth. But nevertheless, it is surprising that the use of titanium is restricted to temperatures less than 400 degrees centigrade. So given such a high melting temperature, higher than that of nickel, for example, you use nickel-based superalloys in environments as hot as 1400 degrees centigrade, but titanium is restricted to temperatures below <coughs> about 400 degrees centigrade. So if you look at the distribution of materials in a typical aircraft engine, you can see that titanium does not make it into the hot zone. Okay, the hot zone is really here, where the temperatures can be of the order of 1400 degrees centigrade. So there is uh, a burn line, effectively, where we restrict the use of titanium to temperature is less than 400 degrees centigrade. Any ideas why? <laughs> they would catch fire. Uh, and the biggest problem arises when titanium rubs against another metal. That's when it catches fire. And the fire can be over in milliseconds. It can leave the rest of the engine empty. So it's a really hot fire. Which is about titanium equivalent as opposed to Yeah. So it's got uh, a protective oxide film, mm -hmm. which is like aluminium. And like aluminium, it has a very, very large enthalpy change when you oxidize it. So once you get the reaction started, and that's the critical thing, it's, uh, it's very hard to stop it. Okay. This is uh, a consequence of a titanium fire in an aircraft engine, and you can see all these plates have basically disappeared. Okay. And this can happen in a very, very short period of time. So this is the reason why we don't use titanium beyond about 400 degrees centigrade, because if a bit of titanium breaks and rubs against another piece of metal, we will have uh, serious consequences in an aircraft engine. Yeah. How is it fast? The most magnified single involves heating up to a flyable temperature or the heating to the liquid and then casting it. Yeah. So how do you cast something that burns above 400 degrees? It doesn't yeah. So it doesn't. Time. I mean, if you take a piece of titanium, if you heat it, even a thousand degrees, it won't burn. It, it's this rubbing action oh. which destroys the passive layer and then problems. So it will be a passive layer even on the half on yeah. metal. And, you know, the other problem would be if you made it into a fine powder when you have a lot of surface for unit volume, that would also be dangerous. But you can certainly cast it, no problems at all, within reason. Okay. So these, for example, are, are the largest plates that you have in an aircraft engine, and they're made by casting, rolling, etc., without any difficulty. Okay, now the crystal structure <coughs> of pure titanium at uh, ambient temperature <coughs> is hexagonal closed back. And you recall that hexagonal closed back means the stacking of layers in A, B, A, B sequence. Okay. So these are the closed back layers of atoms in A, B sequence. And you can see that this is your hexagonal unit cell with an angle of 120 degrees here. Uh, this is the view from the top. And the C over A ratio, that means the C lattice parameter, A lattice parameter, is almost ideal. But, you know, if you, if you look at the closed packing of spheres, then the C over A ratio will be 1.633, ideally. Okay. This just goes to show that atoms don't behave exactly like spheres, but it's not far off ideal. So it's hexagonal closed packed at room temperature. And normally we say that, you know, there are only three slip systems. That means the slip plane is the basal plane, and slip directions are within the three close-back directions within the basal plane, right? 
But in fact, titanium can also slip on this prism plane here, yeah, because that also contains this closed back direction, which is the direction of slip, and on the pyramidal plane, which also contains the closed back direction. It's because of this distortion of the C open A ratio. So, beta titanium, although it doesn't have, uh, sorry, alpha titanium, although it doesn't have the same ductility as a cubic material, it does have, you can deform it. So this is called the alpha phase, the closed back hexagonal structure. Everybody happy with that? So we have sufficient numbers of slip systems for the polycrystalline material to be ductile. Now as we heat the titanium, above 890 degrees centigrade, it becomes body-centered cubic. And this is an extremely ductile phase because we've got lots and lots of slip systems. So we have an allotropic transition. Unlike aluminium, we have an allotropic transition, which means that we can manipulate the microstructure by heat treatment. And that is a major advantage of titanium over aluminium. Now, a lot of titanium is used in the chemicals industry because of its uh, corrosion resistance. And I'll explain that in a bit more detail. But for example, these are reactor vessels. And they may not be completely made out of titanium. You, you might make them out of steel and then clad them with titanium so that the reaction actually happens in the titanium. Uh, the steel gives the supporting strength and uh, structure to the chemical plant. And the titanium would be bonded to the steel uh, by explos explosion bonding, for example. So you have a charge detonated which propagates and solid state bonding of titanium to the steel. A large quantity of titanium is used in the chemicals industry. Okay, this is another example of chemical plant with explosion clad um, titanium. Now, let me explain to you why titanium has a good corrosion resistance. Uh, this is a plot of the corrosion potential versus the corrosion current density. And you can think about this as a plot of free energy versus the rate of reaction. Yeah, because you know that uh, electrochemical potential, if you multiply by you know, Zf, then that becomes the free energy. Yeah? And current density is simply the rate at which a reaction happens. Right? So supposing I take uh, a titanium, then for corrosion to happen, you have to have an anodic site where the metal is dissolving and a cathodic site where you might have hydrogen evolution or oxygen reduction reaction going on. Yeah. Did, did this ring a bell? Mm. Okay. So you need two. You need anodic and cathodic sites. At the anodic site, if you're putting titanium in acid, then we will get the evolution of hydrogen. Okay. So this is the rate at which hydrogen evolves as I alter my electrochemical potential. And just focus on this line for the moment. What determines the steepness of that line? So as I increase my driving force, that means the difference between this and this, I get an increase in the hydrogen evolution rate. But what determines the slope of this line? So think about reactions in general. Okay, you provide a driving force, and even if it is a tiny driving force, why doesn't the reaction occur at an infinite rate? Yeah, and precisely. So there's a barrier to the evolution of hydrogen. Okay, and the bigger that barrier is, the steeper will be the slope. Okay. Now on the anodic side, we. This is a typical form of curve for the dissolution of something that is passive. That means it forms a passive oxide film at a sufficiently large potential. So at first there's a very large reaction rate, but then it drops and we get a very small reaction rate because we formed an oxide film on the surface. Now of course the anodic and cathodic reactions must be balanced, mustn't they? You know, you can't have 
current is going from anode to cathode, so clearly they must be balanced. So this is the net corrosion rate for pure decay, where the current densities are balanced. Everyone happy with that? Now that's too high, and we're not taking advantage of the fact that we have a, we can form a passive oxide film on the surface. So in order to stimulate this crossover to happen in this region, we need to reduce the slope of this hydrogen evolution. So if we add a small amount of palladium or platinum <coughs> or titanium, then you know that hydrogen evolution on platinum or palladium is very easy, and that's why we often use those as references for those <coughs> chemical reactions. Then this line suddenly becomes that slope, and the intersection happens in the passive region, and you've greatly reduced the corrosion current. If okay, so we add a few percent of palladium or platinum to the titanium that is used in chemical plant, and you take advantage of this passive film, greatly reduce the corrosion current. Okay. Of course it's expensive, but it doesn't matter. You can recycle the stuff. Now, these are the typical sorts of phase diagrams for titanium alloys, and they have some obvious labels. This kind of a phase diagram is when we add solute, you increase the extent of the alpha or hexagonal closed packed phase field. Okay, so elements which do that, for example, aluminium, are known as the alpha stabilizing elements. So one good way of remembering which elements stabilize alpha and which elements stabilize beta is as follows, that alpha is hexagonal closed back, beta is body-centered cubic, solutes which are closed packed, for example aluminium, will stabilize beta, uh, oh, I got that wrong. no that's right, uh, so aluminium will stabilize alpha, Whereas solids which are body-centered cubic, for example, molybdenum, will stabilize the beta phase. That's just a rule of the thumb way of remembering which elements should stabilize which phase. Here, when we add a solute, uh, for example, aluminium to titanium alloys, we increase the extent of the beta phase pair, and therefore they are known as beta stabilizers. Now, we can also get eutectoid reactions. So here, for example, is a eutectoid reaction. Supposing I alloy with copper, I can get a eutectoid reaction. Eutectoid means a reaction happening in the solid state, right? And these reactions are incredibly slow in titanium. Any ideas why? You know, perlite in steel, I can form at a really low temperature if I want to and it forms very rapidly. Exactly. So in the case of perlite in steel, it's carbon that is diffusing to form the eutectoid. But here, you know, we would have substitutional elements diffusing to give us the eutectoid reaction. So very frequently, even though this is a eutectoid phase diagram, we don't actually get a eutectoid, and the whole phase diagram behaves as if it is like this. So you can suppress the eutectoid reaction even at relatively slow cooling rates because it requires the diffusion of substitutional atoms. Now, titanium does dissolve a very large quantity of elements and there are some very simple rules as to whether the elements dissolve substitutionally or interstitially. And these come from the work of Hugh Brothery in Oxford back in the 1950s, where you know, if the radius of the atom is about less than 0.6 of the host atom, then the elements dissolve interstitially. So all of these elements dissolve interstitially because the radius is much less than that of titanium, less than about 0.6. 
And if the radius is between 0.85 and 0.15, then they dissolve substitutionally. So large atoms basically dissolve substitutionally, small atoms dissolve interstitially. There's no need for you to remember which elements. Yeah, I'm, I'm just giving you an indication of if you want substantial solubility, then you will get interstitial solution when the atoms are less than 0.6 of the host atom, and substitution solution when it's between 0.85 and 1.15 of the radius of titanium. And beyond that, there's very limited solubility. This applies to any alloy system, not just to titanium. So, uh, the most important elements are listed on this uh, slide, remembering that elements like these, which are closed back, will stabilize the hexagonal closed back phase of titanium, and elements like these, which are body centered cubic in crystal structure, will stabilize the body centered cubic phase of titanium. And these particular elements, they do stabilize beta, but they can also form a eutectoid. So here we might have uh, one of the phases being Ti, uh, a compound of titanium and copper, forming with the beta as a eutectoid. Okay. One of the elements that is very important for titanium is hydrogen because there is a huge solubility of hydrogen in titanium. Uh, and if you look at the dissolution of hydrogen uh, into its atomic state in titanium, or indeed in any other metal, then you can express the free energy change as a standard free energy change plus RT log, the activity of hydrogen inside the material, and the partial pressure of gaseous hydrogen. Yeah. Are you familiar with this? You know, you remember the Allingham diagram? So so this is just an expression for the free energy change when you dissolve hydrogen inside the metal. And to find the equilibrium, I set this to zero, and therefore I have an expression for the activity of hydrogen in your metal as a function of pressure. And we will have this constant term and this term which varies with temperature. And the peculiar thing about titanium is that delta H is negative. So the enthalpy of solution is negative, in other words the hydrogen wants to dissolve in titanium, and titanium can absorb a very large quantity of hydrogen reversibly. Reversibly means I can also get it out by heating it in a vacuum, for example. Now that's, uh, that could be useful, because it's a mechanism for storing hydrogen yeah. in the solid state. So you absorb hydrogen into titanium and then you release it and use it as a fuel source. Um, the other, other characteristic is that hydrogen solubility actually decreases as you raise temperature because of the sign of delta H. Now that means that we can use it potentially uh, to contain the, uh, for construction of the fusion reactor where there's a lot of hydrogen around. At high temperatures, titanium is not brittle by hydrogen because solubility decreases at high temperatures. What sort of when you say decreases by how much? Mean? Yeah, is I don't. I mean, hydrogen still is very good at getting through. Things. It's very good. Unfortunately, I haven't got a scale here. <laughs> okay, yeah. but uh, I can find out for you. Yeah. And, oh. um, at the higher temperatures, titanium is the best for. Yes. yes. Now, one of the difficulties is that um, when hydrogen enters titanium, it forms a hydride. So here is an example of the hydride. And that hydride is associated with a very large volume change of the order of 20% volume change. So that severely embrittles the titanium. Now, of course, if you're using it for fuel storage, then that's not very important. But if it is in a structural application and you get hydride formation, that is very important because it will be severely brittle. It's not just titanium which does this. Zirconium, for example, also forms these hydrides. 
with a very large volume expansion. So it's, it's an important problem. Um, this is the reversible reaction for the storage of hydrogen. Uh, you form titanium hydrides, but which are richer in hydrogen by adding hydrogen, and then you can reverse this reaction to release the hydrogen. Unfortunately, the energy density is only about a tenth of that you get in lead acid batteries at the moment. But here is an example of the hydrogen storage devices that are. This this is uh, a titanium-based hydrogen storage device. Okay. And here it is in a toy car. So, so things are happening, but the density of energy storage is still much smaller than that of a lead acid battery. <coughs> These pictures I took just last year. Yeah. So, um, obviously, once it changes from um, the form source to um, the hydride, mm -hmm. once the hydride, once the reaction goes back to the way, the material is not the same as it was initially. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. But it doesn't matter if it's not a structural application. But I mean, when you then do it again, because it's got all the cracks and everything, can it hold the same amount of hydrogen, or is it slightly? I mean, in principle, you want it in a finely divided state anyway, so that the reactions can happen. So it's not important in this application. Okay, uh, let's now look at some specific alloys, and we'll start with uh, alpha alloys. Remembering that alpha has the hexagonal closed back structure, and there is an empirical equation that is used in industry. Uh, all of these elements stabilize the alpha phase, and this equation is empirical. I don't expect you to remember it, but it indicates the potency of different elements in stabilizing alpha. You notice that oxygen has, is really potent in stabilizing the alpha phase. And one of the problems with aircraft alloys is that if you accidentally introduce oxygen into the alloy, you will end up with very hard alpha particles, which cause major problems with respect to fatigue. Area. So for aircraft alloys, you want to keep the oxygen concentration down as low as possible. One of the major alpha alloys has this composition. Yeah, all of these elements are simply there to solid solution strengthen. But alpha is hexagonal closed packed, and it does have ductility, but it's not sufficient ductility for forming into the components that we want to form. So we add a concentration of molybdenum, which stabilizes a small amount of beta phase at the temperature at which you are going to form the material. Okay, so this is simply added to add a small amount of beta phase into the microstructure to enhance the ductility of the majority alpha alloy. This is by far the most important alloy of titanium. Okay, it counts for the vast majority of titanium alloys marketed. It's a very simple alloy. Titanium with 6 weight percent of aluminium and 4 weight percent of vanadium. And aluminium, of course, has a lower density than titanium. So adding aluminium reduces the density. And aluminium stabilizes the alpha phase, um, whereas vanadium stabilizes the beta phase. So we have a, a microstructure, which is almost an equal mixture of alpha and beta. So this alloy tends to be really quite strong, of the order of uh, 1,100 megapascals, and it can even resist creep at reasonable temperatures where we put it into an aircraft engine or other applications. So this, this is the alloy that we will come across most frequently when we are discussing titanium. Now, of course, uh, the body-centered cubic phase that is the beta phase, uh, has a ductile brittle transition. Okay. Have you come across a ductile brittle transition before? Yeah. Yeah. So let me just quickly explain to you why you get a ductile brittle transition in body-centered cubic metals, generally, and not in 
cubic flows back my flows, although that is only a general rule. Okay. So if I'm plotting uh, the strength versus temperature, um, a body center cubic metal is rather loosely packed. So it's difficult for a dislocation to go from one equilibrium position to another. Yeah, because imagine that we have atoms which are further apart, then the next layer sinks into that layer, doesn't it? And therefore to slip is difficult, whereas if they are close packed, then the depth to which the next layer has sunk into the lower layer is less. So it's easier to slip. So the flow stress is extremely temperature dependent. So this is the flow stress in a body centered cubic matter. On the other hand, the cleavage stress, that means to rip the atoms apart, is temperature insensitive. And therefore, above this temperature, you have ductile deformation, and below this temperature, you have brittle failure. So the fact that we have quite a lot of body center cubic phase in this alloy, and the fact that it is very strong, Unfortunately, it means that its ductile brittle transition temperature is above room temperature, so when it fails, it fails in a brittle manner. Without much ductility. If I drew the corresponding flow stress for, uh, say, austenite, which is face center cubic, it would always be less than the cleavage stress. And that's why you don't get a ductile brittle transition in nickel or iron, which is FCC. <coughs> okay, I'll move on. So this is the typical microstructure of a TR64 alloy, a mixture of alpha and beta. Beta is the stable phase at high temperature and when you cool it, you precipitate these plates of alpha and this is a higher magnification image. So you can see why, where it gets its strength from. It's a very fine microstructure, mixture of two phases and therefore the strength is of the order of 1100 megapascals. Very, very nice alloy. Here, is a, here are some more applications of titanium. Um, these are valves for car engines. And you know that the valves have to move very quickly. Okay? So the lower the mass, the better the response. So if you make them out of light alloys, then that's even better. Unfortunately, these are expensive objects. Okay? We need greatly to reduce the price of titanium, and hopefully the work in this department will lead to a reduction in the price. Okay? There are many, many applications which could open up if we could get cheaper titanium. Now, supposing that I wanted to stop titanium from burning easily, what would you do? What would you add? Chromium. Yeah, very good. Because chromium forms a very strong oxide. Okay, so here is a, a very large chromium addition. And we don't understand why, but just a binary titanium chromium alloy doesn't work in forming this oxide film. Okay. We need to add this large quantity of vanadium as well. Okay. So don't ask me why, but that's how it works. And alloys of this kind can be used up to 500 degrees centigrade. And there is another system which has been invented in Birmingham University. Th this alloy suffers from brittleness. Uh, there's another system which has been invented in Birmingham University, again based on chromium additions, but with certain impurities very carefully controlled so that you get a very high ductility. And that probably is going to have an impact on engine design in the near future. Okay. We have, we have the Beta phase stable at high temperatures is body center cubic, and the alpha phase, which is hexagonal, flows back. And of course, if I cool slowly, 
from the beta phase field, I can precipitate alpha, and that will involve the diffusion of elements because look, the alpha and beta have different equilibrium compositions. But I could also cool extremely rapidly, and then what do you expect will happen? Martensitic transformation, because martensitic transformation does not require diffusion. Now, the martensitic transformation begins at when we undercool below this temperature. And this is known as the martensite start temperature, MS, the martensite start temperature. Any idea why we have to supercool before we get martensite? Sorry, please, uh, louder. I just need to get this. It's a non-equilibrium phase. First of all, we are not allowing elements to partition. So you're trapping elements which really don't want to be there. Okay? Secondly, martensitic transformation is associated with a lot of strain because you're deforming the pattern in which the atoms are arranged. And therefore, the overall shape of your crystal must change. And that shape has to be accommodated with the surroundings. So you have a lot of strain energy. But this is the reason why this line is not parallel to this. It's actually suppressed. So martensitic transformation happens at a lower temperature than equilibrium temperature. So there's no problem in getting martensitic alloys as well. There is one very peculiar transformation. Okay, let me just show you first of all the microstructure of martensite. It forms of tin plates, and we'll understand why martensite forms as tin plates uh, in the next set of lectures, where we'll look at the mechanisms of martensitic transformations in general. And the plane on which the martensite forms is known as the habit plane, and this just happens to be a strange plane which is close to 3, 3, 4 beta. Okay, at the moment we don't understand why, but you will after the next two lectures. And there's a particular orientation relationship between the parent and product phases. So you can see that the closed back plane uh, of the body cubic structure and the closed back plane of the hexagonal martensite. And this is the closed back direction within that closed back plane. This actually isn't completely closed back. It's the closest back plane you can find in a body center cubic. A body centered cubic lattice has no closed back planes. But this is the closest back plane. This is the closed back direction within that plane, and this is the closed back direction within that plane. And when we talk about martensite, you find that this is generally true that the close, closest back planes tend to be parallel, and the closed back directions within those planes also tend to be parallel. So this is the martensite. But there is another very peculiar <coughs> diffusionless transformation that is almost unique to titanium. It does happen in other systems, but it's of the biggest importance in titanium. So imagine that these are our planes of atoms. Okay, so the 111 planes. And you know that the 111 planes are stacked in ABC, ABC sequence, right? What happens is that you effectively get a displacement wave going through the system so that these two planes coalesce. And you double the atomic density in that plane. Okay? So you end up with an AB dashed, AB dashed, AB dashed sequence. With alternate layers having double the atomic density. So you can imagine that's a very strange transformation where you take the 111 planes of beta, which are stacked in ABC sequence. And a pair of those planes collapses to give you an AB dash, AB dash, B dash, because it's now got double the atomic density. And you can see why I'm using a displacement wave, because here this is being pushed in that direction, and this is being pushed in that direction, and that's at a node, so there's nothing happening there. Okay. So you can describe it in terms of a displacement wave. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. You've got, you've got all the atoms in nice, all instructed. How do you think you Push it together. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, the, the only way I can answer how is that there is a reduction in free energy when this happens. So, yeah. so, the, vol so the volume decreases? No, this is, this is the problem. You see, the, this phase severely amplifies the titanium. So, this is called the beta to omega transition. 
uh, it has the most peculiar C over A ratio, which is far less than one. Okay. Far less than one. So, so if you like, AB dashed, AB dashed is like a, like a hexagonal. Yeah? With a C over A ratio, which uh, I'm recalling from memory, is about 0.6, it's in your notes. Mm -hmm. So it's severely embrittled, the title. Mm -hmm. And it's, of course, it's a diffusionless transformation. Now, because of all the strains that this causes, uh, your diffraction pattern becomes streaked. In other words, uh, you know, strain is reflected in changes in lattice parameter, right? You know, if, if I elastically strain the lattice, you are effectively changing the spacing. And remember that in an electron diffraction pattern, the distance between these spots is related to one upon the spacing of those planes. So if I'm causing a variation in the spacing, then I will see streaks in the electron diffraction pattern in this direction. So if you are observing this transformation happening in a transmission electron microscope, you will observe streaking of the pattern, diffuse streaking of the pattern. Okay, uh, to finish off, uh, uh, there, there is an important class of alloys which uh, are precipitation hardened alloys. So obviously, if you have a phase diagram which shows um, which shows this kind of miscibility, uh, of solubility change. Then you can age harden it by heat treating here, quenching, and allowing precipitation to happen. And the most popular alloy for this kind of uh, heat treatment is the titanium copper system. So this is a popular alloy in which we precipitate Ti2Cu. You can see the Ti2Cu. And these dark regions that you see are strain fields. Yeah, this is a transmission electron micrograph, and if you have strain, then you'll get diffraction effects. So these coherency strains, they harden the material. So this is a precipitation hardened alloy. Now finally, a few years ago, there was a huge interest in making intermetallic compounds with titanium. So for example, um, okay, this is just the titanium copper, precipitation hardened, component, um, we can make titanium aluminides, TIAL or TIAL3. And of course, they have the big advantage of low density and oxidation resistance. But like many intermetallic compounds, they're not particularly ductile. Okay, and that's the reason why they haven't been as successful as they might have been. But there are certain applications where there are their oxidation resistance, because they have a large concentration of aluminium, is very important. And this is a turbocharger. You know, they, they rotate at a very, very high RPM. I forget the numbers, but it's of the order of 10,000 RPM. So in a, in a powerful car, you know, you want to boost the power, then you have something known as a turbocharger. And this one is made out of titanium aluminum, a very low density. And if you compare that with the previous technology, then they were made out of nickel-based superalloys, which has a much higher density, of the order of 8 grams per centimeter cubed. So there are some applications of titanium aluminides, which are now uh, you know, industrially important, and already find applications in very expensive cars. But in general, because of their lack of ductility, they haven't lived up to the promise just five or ten years ago. Okay, so that finishes titanium alloys, and the next two lectures I will deal with uh, Martin City transformations. Do you have any questions? Um, in the beta tomato transformation, the uh, little white spots that push on the microphone yeah. are these voids. No, those were the actual omega phase. Oh. So, so it looks like precipitates, doesn't it? Uh, but these are the omega phase particles.
Uh, you had a question? Yeah, I'm still not sure I understand how that works. How the right. right. The data will make a transformation. Mm -hmm. So look, we have these planes of atoms, uh, which are the one 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 planes, and they're stacked in a repeat sequence A B C A B C, and they all have the same numbers of atoms per unit area. Mm -hmm. okay. Now imagine that I pass a displacement wave through the system, okay, where this represents the magnitude of the displacement. Okay. This A plane is located at the nodes, so it's not affected by the displacement wave. The B plane will be displaced in this direction, and this will be displaced in the opposite direction because it's a negative displacement. So that causes the B and C planes to collapse. But there's no overall volume change. There is a volume change, a, a large volume change. Mm. So overall, from beta to omega, there's, yeah. it's, there's, uh, the, the, if you have chunk metal, it shrink. Well, the, the, the phase fraction is quite small. Then you can see the amount of omega that we formed is quite small. It's not the whole of it that transforms into omega. Small regions. Can you say this like this place is going through? What's the, what is the driving force for this? Yeah, yeah. I mean, the displacement wave is just a way of yeah. thinking about it. Yeah. But the driving force is that we have added so much alloying element okay, that we are, we are somewhere in this region mm -hmm. and the beta doesn't want to stay as beta. You know, it's not a stable phase. Okay. Yeah. Right. Can't change no. So simply that we have supercooled it sufficiently to stimulate this particular transformation. It's not an equilibrium phase. Would it be possible to make the entire uh, material question. change? Yeah. Because then you surely can have a really good reversible. Mm -hmm. It's a good question. I, I don't know is the answer, but it's a very good question to think about. So mm -hmm. does, does that, just sorry, yeah, I'm trying to imagine the idea of trying to fit that many atoms in. Yeah. Does that induce a large amount of stress in yeah. that, that single plane? It does, and this is the reason why we get a peculiar C upon A ratio and also why we embrittle the material when the omega phase forms. Okay, good. <laughs>